I'd like to look at three common performance measures, the Trainor, the Jensen's Alpha, and the Sharp measure, but in the context of the security market line and the capital market line, so that we have a way to interpret them. And then my spreadsheet you can also download, which does have dynamic labels if you want to take a closer look. So what I'd like to do is look at these three popular performance measures, but not just as abstract mathematical functions, you've seen that before, but rather interpreting them in the context of the security market line and the capital market line that I reviewed in the previous three videos. So those, these three measures are the Trainor measure, and that was developed by Jack Trainor, who unfortunately died only last year, a great man in finance. Jensen's alpha and the sharp ratio or sharp measure. So these are part of a class of measures called risk adjusted performance measures or rampums. Risk adjusted because they are return measures, but they are adjusted for some measure of risk. So you have lots of ways to go here. These are just three of the more popular or well known. In order to do that, I need some assumptions. For the overall market portfolio, I'm assuming a risk free rate of 4%, a little higher than lately. And then I'm assuming the market portfolio returns 8%. So the difference is the excess return, unless otherwise specified excess, usually connotes in excess of the risk-free rate. So what this is 4%, and we could also call that an equity risk premium. Then I have for the market's volatility or standard deviation, as usual denoted in sigma, that is 12%. So given that assumptions, I can then look at the performance of the portfolio. What performance did the portfolio turn in? But I do want to say that for these three measures in general, Trainor, Jensen's, Sharp, these are in general what we would call ex-post measures, ex-post performance measures, as opposed to ex-ante performance measures, which they are really not. Ex-post meaning these are evaluating the performance after the performance has been turned in. It's not about what we expect going forward. So in terms of ex post, then we just need to remember we're imagining that this is portfolio performance that we've actually observed and we've captured. So I just imagine that it's a 10% return. Right away, you'll notice it's higher than the market's return of 8% by plus 2%. If the market's the benchmark, we could call that an active return. Then but I'm going to say that's coming at the cost of higher volatility, 15%. And then I have a correlation assumption here between the portfolio and the market. Let's say we've observed it's 0 0.60. I do that because I do like to remind of the direct connection, but the difference between correlation and beta, right? Correlation informs here a covariance of 0 0.01080 covariance between the portfolio and the market. It's a, it's a low number, is a good gut check on that, but it's also not intuitive by itself. That covariance always is the product of the volatilities and the correlation. So 12% for the market volatility, 15% for the portfolio, 0 0.60 for my observed correlation. That product gives me the covariance. Beta is then the covariance divided by the variance of the market or correlation multiplied by cross volatility. This I reviewed also in a previous video. So it's correlation of 0 0.60 multiplied by the ratio of volatilities, 15 and 12, gives me this by design, I wanted a almost uh, round beta of 0 0.750. So that's the what we have for the beta of this portfolio with respect to the market returns. Finally, here in terms of the set of portfolio assumptions, I am showing here what the cap M tells us is the expected return of the portfolio. Now the cap M by definition is an ex ante model, right? It's telling us we expect the portfolio performance to be 7%, it's not what we got, because the cap M expects alpha of zero. It's telling us that we would expect the risk-free rate of 4% plus the equity a risk premium of 4% multiplied by the portfolio's beta of 0.75. In other words, if the expected return is a function only of the portfolio's systematic risk or exposure to that common market factor and all idiosyncratic risk is diversified away to zero in the portfolio, then we should get 7%. So that's the capital asset pricing model and 
it is visualized, right, or manifest in the blue line here, which is the security market line. So the security market line in blue has here, it's anchored on the at the risk-free rate, but also at the market portfolio, which by definition has beta of one. And at the y-axis here, I didn't label it to save clutter. The y-axis here is return. So the market's return, the market's return of 8% corresponds to its beta of one. And then the slope of this mark of this uh, security market line is the slope of the market portfolio, which is of course rise over run, and the rise is the excess return, 8% minus the risk-free rate. And then the run is um, by definition here one. So the slope of the security market line is uh, the excess return on the market or the equity risk premium, in this case of 4%. So we can understand the portfolio's train, train R ratio measure in relation to the security market line and the slope. It's better if the slope is steeper and it, the benchmark here really is the equity risk premium in this case. So that gives us some context to the trainer, right? Because as an abstract number, we calculate it when we go 0 0.08. Um, what does that mean? Well, the benchmark here really is the slope of the security market line, which is the equity risk premium or market risk premium of 4%. Here we're double, the slope is double. That's how we can visually interpret the trainor. For, because for our, our portfolio, that trainor, again, it's a risk adjusted return measure. So the return's in the numerator and it's just the portfolio's excess return, 10 minus 4% adjusted by or divided by, in the case of Trainor, the idea is that the appropriate measure of risk is beta, in this case 0.75. That's why it's really only well suited for portfolios that are already well diversified because it's not counting total risk. But in this case we got 0 0.08 and you can see visually relative to the reference it's double but the line is just much steeper and we get so we can see if I brought this down if I bought the portfolio return down to nine percent this would become more shallow eight percent closer to the line and seven percent for the portfolio is exactly what the capital asset pricing model expects from us I'll put it back to ten percent so we're auto automatically almost right at the Jensen's Alpha, sometimes called the Alpha, but not a good idea because we want to call it the Jensen's Alpha because the Jensen's Alpha is a instance of Alpha, but specifically in the capital asset pricing model context where there's only a single factor. So it's kind of a naive Alpha. There are much more sophisticated Alphas out there. But notice the Jensen's Alpha then becomes really straightforward here. It's the outperformance relative to this security market line. And in this case, uh, I'll go right here to the Jensen's Alpha, it's 3% because my capital asset pricing model, given a beta of 0.5, expects expected here a, port, a, perfor, a performance of uh, 7%, but we got a performance of 10%. 7 and 10. 7 was a tech, uh, 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 expected for the cap M. I didn't do my 7 very well. 10 is what we got. 3 is the vertical distance here, and that's the Jensen's Alpha. It's really the vertical distance off that security market line, which predicts the portfolio's performance. So we have 3% out performance. We just take the portfolio performance minus the risk-free rate minus the uh, beta times the equity risk premium. So this Jensen's Alpha is really just a rearrangement of the capital asset pricing model and specifically backing out any residual. So that means, of course, that it can also be negative. It also means that that trainor ratio here is um, directly related, related to the uh, market the equity risk premium and the difference here is it's just the trainer the portfolio's trainer ratio is the equity risk premium plus alpha divided by beta actually in this case 
the alpha is uh, 3% divided by the beta of 0 0.75 gives you 4%. And see how the, the equity risk premium 4%, if we add that to 4%, we get the trainer of really 8%. So that's really the trainer and the Jensen's Alpha. Real quick, I'll swap this out and put in my other, my sharp ratio chart, which is includes the capital market line. And note, so the, diff, the key difference here is that we have standard deviation on the x-axis. And then recall we had the portfolio possibilities curve but then we introduce the risk-free rate as an anchor. And the point of tangency here is the market portfolio. Then we had the capital market line in, indicated by blue, which has the set of efficient portfolios because they dominate the risk return space up here. And the slope of this capital market line, it also rise of run again, of course. Rise, the rise is eight for the market, is eight minus four or 4%. But in this case, the run is not one, but it's the standard deviation of the market's portfolio, of the market, 12%. So this slope here of that blue capital market line is about a third, right? 4% divided by 12%, well, it is a third, 0.33. So that is not only the slope of the blue capital market line, but represents the sharp ratio of all points on the capital market line, and therefore, really, the in theory, the highest sharp ratio. So uh, the, the sharp ratio that can be achieved by all the efficient portfolios. So that's the intuitive reference for that. The here, before we look at the portfolio, we're saying, well, a, an efficient portfolio is a third, a, a sharp ratio of a third. Okay, so then we, but we come along, we look at the portfolio's performance, which you already know has significant alpha in it, 3%. That's very significant. So again, same numerator as the uh, trainor, excess return for the portfolio of 6%. That's the ex post return that was observed divided by the portfolio's standard deviation or volatility 15%, 0.4. So that's the green line and, and the, I'm sorry, yeah, the green line and the green triangle in particular is the portfolio's outcome. And again here visually, we can see it dominates because it's a matter of steeper slope. The portfolio sharp ratio of 0.4 compares to what, what, Otherwise, we expect to be efficient of one-third. So this would be um, material uh, outperformance. So that's how we look at the uh, sharp ratio. And again, the uh, x-axis there is total risk, standard deviation, whereas the trainor ratio would be appropriate for well-diversified portfolios. So we really only need to look at beta. The sharp ratio would be more appropriate if the portfolio is not well diversified because we want to adjust that return for a measure of total risk. I hope that's helpful.